We're really delighted to be here. Um, we want to give huge thanks to Simona and Lisa and the North London Social Work Teaching Partnership for your warm welcome and collaboration on this issue. We've got some video clips that range from children's resources to voices of women in prison. Um, we will be sharing the slides and the links um, later on. I believe they'll be uploaded um, so people can find those after today. In terms of trigger warnings, we're not expecting to encounter um, intensely upsetting material, but just bear in mind this session is about issues surrounding imprisonment. So there will be children's and adults' voices talking about their own experiences of the justice system. Um, keep yourself emotionally safe. You can put the session on mute to take a break away from the screen. Um, just make sure that you are um, comfortable at all times. I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. So um, let's introduce the people that you can see on the screen. So I'm Jo Mulcahy. I'm Assistant Director of Services for the Prison Advice and Care Trust. As well as being PACT's lead for safeguarding, um, I've got a remit which includes obviously a national project. So for example, our Welfare Grants Unit, our National Helpline, and some grant funded projects such as this, Together a Chance, which is generously funded by the Sylvia Adams Charitable Trust. My background is work with children, um, from primary school teaching to play and community development through to therapeutic work with children, forest schools, private counselling practice and bereavement support um, through Crews volunteering for 10 years. Um, this is my colleague Katia. Hi, I'm Katia. I'm actually the social worker at HMP Send, which is set in Surrey, kind of South London, Guildford area. Um, my background is in child protection, so with the local authority working around assessment of children and um, vulnerable, vulnerable families. Um, so that's kind of where I've been for the last eight, nine years. Um, and now I'm working in the prison system. Thanks, Katia. And we'll hear more from Katia later. And this is my colleague, Becky. Hi, guys. I'm Becky and I'm the other social worker uh, at HMP Eastwood Park, which is in Gloucester, South Gloucestershire area. Um, my background is also social work, but more so from an adult perspective. Um, so quite varied mental health, homelessness, offending, addiction. Um, a lot of the time there is a crossover where many of those people are parents. And so I have had some involvement sort of in, in children's social work in that capacity. But yeah, my background is predominantly adults. Thank you so much, Becky. We'll hear from you more in detail about that later too. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about PACT um, as a starting point. So PACT's a national charity. We support people who've been affected by imprisonment. And our aim is to minimise the harm caused by imprisonment on prisoners, on their families, their communities, and to work to ensure that people, including professionals, are best equipped to have a positive future. We've got services across England and Wales. Um, it includes one-to-one -one casework with men and women in prison, including those who are deemed hardest to reach. Um, relationship, parenting education, we do personal wellbeing, coaching, family visits to prisons. We support children affected by imprisonment. Um, we provide services for people on probation and support from community-based activity hubs. We have a number of grant funded projects, including Visiting Mum, um, which supports visits by children to their mother who'd otherwise not be able to visit. And we also work to support safer custody departments in prisons with processing concerns about family members who are worried about their loved ones in prison. Today, um, we're here to talk about one of those grant funded projects, Together a Chance. So a charitably funded project, um, which has placed the first family social workers into two women's prisons, which is HMP Eastwood Park in South Gloucester, where Becky is, and HMP Send in Surrey with Katia. I wonder if we can start by um, a poll which asks how many people are currently in prison in the UK. So if you can give me your opinion, if you're in the live room, um, if you're watching later, have a think, note down what it is that you think. How many people are currently in prison in the UK? The choices we've got are 8,000, 80,000 or 800,000. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, it's 80,000 currently 
so as of last week, there were 79,746 people um, in prisons, and that was out of a possible operational capacity of 82,344. So it's around 80,000 people in prison, so well done whoever selected that on the option. So the government in um, 2021, in December, published a white paper uh, prison strategy paper and they outlined their intention to create 20,000 new prison spaces by the middle of this decade um, with the reason of cutting crime. It seems to me um, that that would take us to the unprecedented position of having 100,000 prison spaces um, which presumably means we have to fill them which also begs the question you know are the millions being put into that not better used on early intervention and support to cut crime? Um, but we are here for a practical, not political discussion. Um, but if you want to hear more about that, you can read a blog by our CEO, Andy Keane Downs, and he will articulate um, our counter argument much more articulately. So another poll for you, thinking about those 80,000 people in prison, how many people, How what percentage of those are women? And I'm just going to publish that. So is it 5%? Of those 80,000? Is it 15% of those 80,000? Or is it 50% of those 80,000? How many of those people are women? What's the female prison population if the overall prison population is 80,000? So we've got a vote in for 5%, we've got a vote in for 15%. Okay, um, it's actually 5%. So well done to the people in the 5% group. Um, so out of last week's population, 3,231 were women. So it's around 4, 4.5%. Four um, but generally it sits at around 5% of the population being women in prison. Despite making up only 5%, however, they account for almost a quarter of cases of self-harm across the whole prison estate. Um, most women in prison for non-violent non -violent offences, so for example shoplifting, benefit fraud, and actually in 2020 more women were sent to prison to serve a sentence for theft than for violence against the person, robbery, sexual offences, drugs and motoring offences combined. Um, so theft and shoplifting are the primary reasons that women are in prison. The other thing about women in prison is they're likely to be victims as well as offenders. So over half of women in prison report having suffered domestic violence. 53% um, of women reported having experienced emotional, physical or sexual abuse as a child. And there's a really good piece of work by the Prison Reform Trust um, about women in prison. Okay, so moving on from thinking about women in prison to thinking about the children of those people um, who are in prison. How many children do you think um, experience parental imprisonment over the course of a year? So roughly how many children are estimated every year to experience the imprisonment of a parent? So we say estimate because there's no mechanism for recording this. Um, we rely on people telling us when they come into custody. And then if they do tell us there isn't a routine way that sort of people are contacted or there's no automatic flag system to schools or social services. And the other thing about this is that we're just talking about parents, so not siblings, not other family members. We've got options of 2,000, 20,000 or 200,000. Like I see, we've got a vote in for 20,000. Thank you very much, that person. I will put you out of your misery and say that it's 200,000. Um, so taking 2009 as an example, that was over three times the number in care that year, which was around 65,500. And it's over five times the number on the Child Protection Register, which was about 36,500. I think it's sort of well, well known in the sector that more children are affected by parental imprisonment than by divorce. Um, and it's estimated that 7% of school aged children experience the imprisonment of their father. And that's just fathers, not other family members. <clears throat> Out of these 200,000, um, 17,000 of those children are estimated to have had a mother in prison. Um, and figures say that only 9% of children are cared for by their father when their mother goes to prison, and only 5% stay in their family home. So, without doubt, extremely confusing, disruptive 
distress in time for children. And that's what we are sort of focusing on at the heart of this project. Um, it is shocking. It's a huge issue. And that's why it's called a hidden sentence. So it's a very hidden problem. People don't tend to talk about it. I would really like to encourage you to reflect on this. And I'd be really interested in your honest opinions. When you hear that a mother on your caseload is in prison, what are your first thoughts, assumptions and, and impressions? And if you're watching this later outside of the, the live session, I'd really invite you to think about this and maybe jot down some, some initial impressions. So with a bit of that context in mind, the next thing that I want to do is to show us a clip. Um, it's going to help us put children's voices at the heart of the session. Um, it's about four and a half minutes long and it outlines the story of Kyra. So I'm just going to pop this video. Um, so Kyra's video, um, her name has been changed, but these are her own words in her own voice her story told in her own way. She was part of a youth project run by PACT called Hear Our Voice. Um, it was based in London and it empowered young people to tell their story about their experiences with the criminal justice system. Some of these then were used in our police training package um, and they aim to equip forces to take a trauma-informed approach, particularly to things like house arrest when there are children present. So without further delay, let me show you Kyra. Hello, I'm Michael Palin. Every year there are around 200,000 children in the UK living with the pain and trauma of having a parent in prison. That's more than double the number of children who are affected by divorce. The imprisonment of a parent can have a devastating impact on a child. It is a sentence they live with every day. When they get up in the morning, when they go to school, when they speak to their friends. It can affect every aspect of their lives, leaving them feeling isolated and alone, with no one to talk to and nowhere to turn. The film you're about to watch tells the story of Kyra, a girl who thought her stepdad was working away as a bus driver, but found that he was actually in prison. This is Kyra's story. Mum said that he was um, doing a job as a bus worker, so we had to go somewhere far. And then she told me a few days before we went. I felt scared and happy. The night before, Mum was rushing us about to get ready because we had to leave really early. I was annoyed and confused. I had nobody to talk to about how I was feeling. I didn't even know why he was in prison. The day come, I was still annoyed and confused, but excited to go and see my stepdad. It was the first time I had been to a prison before. I was scared and worried. I still had lots of questions. I looked at mum and she was, look, was like, she looked upset. The prison was a long way away. We had to get a train. When we got there, I felt like everybody was looking at me. Mum said that we had to get searched by dogs. I was scared that they would bite me. When I was searched, it made me feel like a prisoner. I didn't like it. I was glad when it was all over. There was lots of people and children. I thought to myself that all the kids didn't have a dad at home either. That made me feel like I wasn't the only one. When I saw my stepdad, I was so happy. We got to go and visit him quite often and our relationship somehow grew stronger. I knew that he loved me and even though he is in prison, that he is still there for me. He's not going to be in prison forever and I can still see him, speak to him and know that he's well. Things changed again. My stepdad had to move prison far away. Now we hardly see him. I feel angry and sad. I have my youth worker from PACT. I can talk to her about anything or how I'm feeling. 
it helps me in general at school and in my and my relationship, especially with my mum. Having my youth worker means I can tell her things so that they don't build up and blow up inside me. In the past year, PACT has helped more than 12,000 children to visit a family member in prison. Their family workers are on hand to support young people who are visiting their mum or dad in prison, helping them to feel less afraid and to enjoy the short amount of time they get to spend with their parent during a visit. PACT believes that these children should have a safe space to talk about how they feel, what they think, and have their voices heard. PACT believes that all children deserve the chance of a bright future, that just because you have a mum, a dad, a brother or sister in prison doesn't mean that you won't fill your potential. That's what PACT believes. That's what I believe. If that's what you believe, please support PACT so that they can continue to provide these vital services to help young people like Kyra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, lovely Michael Peel in there, um, supporting the Children's Charter and um, children who have had parents in prison. A very lovely and understanding man. Okay. I'm going to go back to the slides and talk a bit about um, how this project started. So as a bit of background, it came largely came about as a result of a review by Michael Farmer. So he firstly examined family ties in the male estate in 2017 and the result was a report called the importance of strengthening prisoners family ties to prevent reoffending and reduce intergenerational crime also known as the farmer report and um, the evidence base for that was that people in prison who maintain good positive family relationships are 39 percent less likely to offend in 2019, so a couple of years later, um, recognising that women in prison are a different cohort with different relationships, different dynamics, different needs, um, Lord Farmer undertook a second report and he looked specifically at the women's prison estate. And one of the recommendations from this report was that women's relationships were so complex that he considered professional social workers working specifically with the, the mothers. Um, and today, when I talk about mothers, I also infer grandmothers, carers and other women who are important in family lives, um, that it would help to be more better involved, better understood, that women in prison needed more equitable access to advice, information, to services, to allow them to participate fully in decisions involving their children. And that echoed an earlier recommendation that had already been made to us um, after the evaluation of the Pact Visiting Mum project at Hayes MP Eastwood Park. So Sylvia Adams Foundation were already funding a project with PACT at the time. Um, we worked together. They were really interested in being at the forefront of this initiative. Um, and as so many interventions and services, innovation from the charity sector often drives improvement and the standardisation then of services across that wider prison estate. So PACT a pilot in this um, with support from Sylvia Adams. And we hope that the impact, which has been evaluated by Cardiff University, um, will prompt the widening of this service to all people across female and male prison estates. Together, Chance works alongside our family engagement teams in prisons um, and work with the most complex caseloads and usually where there's court or social services involvement. Just about the aims then of the project, we hope that by working with mothers in prison, we will level the playing field. We know that there's huge inequality in terms of access to support for women um, and that affects their ability to build bridges with professionals, including social services, and to work alongside them. Many of the women that we work with have had challenging personal experiences, to say the least. 
um, especially challenging where other professionals have been involved sometimes and it can make it very hard for them to trust and engage with professionals on a sort of ongoing basis. We want women to be more involved, to be better informed and then in, in turn we think that will reduce their trauma around the family situation which can only be a good thing for the whole family. Just as interest, so in 2018, we had a student um, who was doing a placement at one of our sites and she did a bit of research on the relationship between women in custody and their social workers in the community. And she asked mothers what they thought social workers thought about them. And out of 29 answers from people in that group, not one of those people said something positive. Um, we had answers like scum, naive, a bad mum, uh, a failure, I'm not worth caring about. So people really have a bad view of how they're regarded from the outside. The second part of that was we asked them what they thought of their children's social workers. Um, and they used words like cruel, uh, judgmental, not willing to listen, heartless. Um, one person gave an example that she'd been judged for being a victim of domestic abuse. Um, another one said her social worker was always late, but when she herself was late, it was used against her. Um, and so there, there clearly was a need for bridge building between women in prison and social services. And this is in absolutely no way profession bashing. This is women's honest views, feelings based on their own experiences. Of course, they're coloured by emotion and frustration. But it is a reminder to us that there's a human being at the end of that legal process. There's a person on the other side of that argument. Um, we are here to help women connect with social workers. We want to create strong working alliances so that we can achieve better outcomes. I feel like I should stress here as well um, that by involving and supporting mothers in prison, we're not suggesting that custody of children or contact with children is always the right outcome. We apply the, the principle of the best interests of the child, just the same as across the social work profession. And sometimes our work is helping the parent or the carer in custody to understand what they want as a parent isn't what's best for the child. And we can support them in seeing things from other professionals and their children's point of view. We have had some challenging cases, um, for example, when the offence is against or involving their children. And Katia and Becky will give some examples of that as we talk about cases a bit later on. We are curious to know how many people um, here have worked with someone in prison. Um, it's If anyone's got any learning from previous experiences that you'd like to share, if you've got examples of good practice or challenges, you can drop some comments into the chat. Um, or there's a contact us slide later on where you can email us if you've got suggestions, if you've got questions, if you've got comments. Um, we really do encourage learning from each other and we'd absolutely like to learn from your experiences as well. I'm going to hand over to Becky and Katia um, to talk a bit about operationally what this looks like. Um, so yeah, as Joe said, sort of a bit more operation, you know, what it looks like on the ground and what it is that Katia and I have been actually doing for the last year. Um, so the social work role is intended to act as an advocate for women whose children are in or at risk of being taken to local authority care or have social work involvement and form part of that team around the child. So these four boxes are kind of a very brief overview of the different types of work that we've been doing. Um, so the one-to-one -one work with mothers and the parenting and relationship support, um, by nature, as Joe sort of explained earlier, we're working with particularly complex cases and that's sort of defined really by the level of involvement by social services in the community, um, perhaps by offence or certain dynamics within the family. Um, they just mean that having that extra perspective and that social work input uh, is hopefully beneficial. So we work typically with much smaller caseloads, which means that we can work much more intensively with the mothers in custody. Um, and it also enables us to sort of carry out higher levels of multi-agency working. Um, as we referred to earlier, one of those agencies being the local authority and uh, trying to support mothers to develop 
more positive um, and honest and open working relationships with their children, social workers, um, but also other services within the prison. One of the really useful ones uh, is OMU, which is the offender manager unit, and they have a lot to do with sentence planning for mums in prison. So that's something that we often encourage the community social workers to become involved with as well. It can be a really good opportunity for mum to do some work around areas of concern that perhaps social workers have in a safe space where she can access some perhaps more intensive professional support. Um, <clears throat> as an example as well, just of how that can be beneficial on both sides, you know, mum can benefit from this more intensive support that's around her, um, but also the local authority can benefit too from having better relationships and, and better communication, perhaps more consistent than it was in the community. Um, so just as an example, I've been working with a mum who had committed an offence which involved her children. And as part of that, the local authority where she was from wanted to complete a safeguarding review, um, which not only I was able to help to facilitate and arrange for the interviews, um, but also after the review had taken place, um, I've played a really big part in going through that review with mum. And understandably, it's been quite an intense and, and distressing process, but um, it's enabled everybody on all sides to really benefit and learn from what happened. Um, the next one is uh, quality information, which we've sort of broken down into information for prisoners and also information uh, for professionals. So as Joe touched upon, uh, mothers in prison have much more limited access to advice and support and information. Um, you know, they can't just pick up a phone and call a bunch of different solicitors or go on Google and look things up. So that's an area where we really want to seek to make some positive change. Um, so as part of our social work role, uh, we routinely share information with mothers about their legal rights as parents. We explain court processes. We explain different orders. Um, some of that's just through conversation. Some of it's through documents and bits and pieces that we make and share with mums. Some of it's talking to their family members and just getting that information out there in a way that is accessible and that is that's perhaps delivered in a way that is um, more easy for them to understand. Obviously, we all know what the professional jargon can be like, um, but also enabling access to quality information. So I'm not a solicitor. Um, and so, you know, that could be access to legal clinics, facilitating access to free legal advice um, and formal representation if there are court proceedings. Um, so I think Joe's going to talk a little bit more now about sort of how we use information to kind of improve the knowledge base and things of professionals and then a bit more on a wider level about the strategic stuff that we've been doing. Thanks Becky. So absolutely we're working to provide information for professionals. Um, Becky and Katya have been working uh, with a local authority that we've been working closely with to write and distribute information style guides. Um, so we've got some for prison professionals uh, which are guides to social services, to social services processes around children so that they can understand how things work and are better able then to support the parent in prison. So that helps packed family engagement workers um, to better prepare debrief women before and after meetings or court proceedings. And it also helps key workers, offender managers, prison officers, probation practitioners, and mother and baby unit ladies and officers to support women better. So by giving a bit more um, accessible information about those proceedings, they can better engage with them and feel a bit more in control. As part of that, we're sort of looking at wider strategic change, which means that women in prison are better supported. So, for example, through awareness raising webinars and workshops like this one, um, we've also produced some practitioner resources um, which Becky and Katya worked with the local authority to do um, and that's based on what social services practitioners look for. So um, for example we've produced some resources on how to keep in contact with people on your caseload who are in prison, um, the limitations that they might have, some practical tips for effective engagement and that will be available as part of a toolkit hosted on our prison advice website. I also have an example in the files. So this is a guide to working with parents in prison. And this will be available for download along with the recording of the webinar afterwards. So it still will be available to you. 
Um, if you think of anything else um, that might be really useful for you, if you think there's something for a resource bank for practitioners, if you'd like to contribute something such as a reflective piece or a case study or a helpful website that you found, please do get in touch with us using the contact details at the end, um, because what we really like to do is to create a resource bank that works for you with as much information there as possible. Also, as part of um, of the strategic change aspect of things. We're looking to achieve systems change where we find that the system's not quite working. So for example, um, parents who need to be produced at family court, they're sometimes only given a few hours notice. Sometimes they're not informed at all. Um, and that sort of from your point of view could give the impression of that person being unprepared or if they don't show up to court proceedings at all, could naturally be interpreted as the parent not caring or not being interested enough to attend. More often, it's a case of they've got no way of knowing that that's going ahead. So PACT are currently working to encourage a system where maybe a flag is applied if a person's in prison, the production order from the court to the prison can be sent in good time, allowing the prison time to escort and the parent time to prepare. So it sounds like a very straightforward thing, but actually the system's not very good at dealing with it. And that's the kind of strategic change that we would like to see. So another reflective question for you. Um, I also acknowledge your comment about the parent's relationship with the caregiver um, being critical to facilitating contact with their child. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and that may well come up in some of the case studies that we will discuss in, um, in the next few slides. So thank you for that. What sort of strategic change do you think are needed from your point of view? So we've looked at this from the women's point of view in prison, but we'd be really interested in what you think um, the sort of strategic change are that are needed to better support people in prison. Um, we're, we're just really interested in your views. So if you think about anything later on after this session, again, use the contact details to let us know. Um, but we'd like to take a sort of 360 view on what it is so that we can include things um, as part of this project that would really make some impact um, to you in the community and to women in prison. So I'm going to show you another clip. Um, it's called A Journey Into Prison. And this is more of a resource, really. Um, it was designed um, by children uh, from a different project that we were running. It's suitable for younger audiences and it's an animation of um, a sort of journey through the criminal justice system. And what we're hoping today is that you find it a useful resource if you need to explain the system to children, if that ever comes up for you. Um, but for the purposes of this awareness session, we're regarding it as a reminder that being in prison is not a short process. It's not something that's happened suddenly. And actually, the family is in the middle of a whole series of events which has affected their family by the time they get to prison. So this clip is just under four minutes long. And I'm going to start that now. Here we go. When someone goes to jail, things can be very confusing and there can be lots of things going on that are hard to understand. Let's have a look at what someone's journey into prison might look like. Adults have a set of rules called the law. They are there to keep everyone safe and to make everything fair. Doing something that is against the law is called a crime. If someone has committed a crime, they might be arrested by the police. This means that the police are allowed to take them to a police station to ask them questions about what they have done. If the police think that the law has been broken, that person might go to court. A court is a place where a judge can hear evidence that the person has committed a crime. The judge listens carefully to what everyone has to say. He knows all about the law and can decide if the rules have been broken. Police might show the judge photographs or other clues that a crime has happened. This is called evidence. It means that the police can prove that the law has been broken. Someone who saw the crime happening is called a witness. They might go to court to tell the judge what they saw. 
If the person says that they did break the law, or if the judge says that they did, then that person is guilty. The judge will tell them what happens next. This is called a sentence. If a person is found not to have done it, they are not guilty and they will get to go home. Sentence. This is what the judge thinks is a suitable punishment for the person breaking the law. They may have to pay money, called a fine, to do some work for free, called a community sentence, or they may have to go to jail. The judge decides how much to pay or how long to go to jail for. It depends on what the person has done. A prison or jail is where people who have broken the law go. There are special people called prison officers who look after them. There are other people who help them too. To learn about the law and help them to understand why they should not break it. When a person is let out of prison, it is known as being released. They will have a date that they will be let out and this is called their release date. When people get out of prison, they usually have to be on probation. This means that there is a special person called a probation officer who looks after them and makes sure that they are okay when they are released. They will have to see the person now and then to check how things are going. Sometimes people are released from prison, but they have a special box attached to their ankle called a tag. They might have to be home by a certain time and might not be allowed to go to some places if their probation officer thinks that they might break the law again. The box is small and you can't see it if it's hidden by their clothes. They don't have to wear it forever, just until their probation officer says so. It can be hard when someone you know goes to jail. If you want to know more about someone's journey, you can talk to someone you can trust to help you. You can find out more at www.prisonadvice.org.uk Thank you. We hope that you found that useful um, and the links to these will be available later on as well as the um, this presentation. So I'm going to hand over to Katia um, to talk a bit more about cases and what a sort of typical day looks like, what typical cases look like. Katia, over to you. Right. So just to give you guys a bit of context, because um, I know some said that you've never worked in prison before. Um, or worked with a prisoner before. Um, so there's 11 women prisons across the country. Um, some have mother baby units on there, some don't. Um, there's also no women's prison in Wales currently. Um, so you can imagine how women can be really far from their families um, since the prisons are so spread out around the country. Um, and on average, um, women are held about 60 miles from their home. Um, so it's, it, it can be really challenging to, to keep contact between you know mothers and children um, also women prisons are usually not categorized so that means that they hold women who have committed all types of crimes so that can range from kind of drug offenses to fraud um, and robbery as well as murder and sexual offenses and they're all kind of kept in the same place it's very different than men's estate um, so typically uh, a I guess a day in the life of what me and Becky do, um, it can look very different from day to day. So we both actually work inside of the prison um, in an office, which is either on the wing where prisoners live, or it could be in a separate building. Um, and it might be a bit silly to say, but we um, don't have access to our cell phones, laptops. We don't have access to Zoom, Microsoft Teams. Um, I know speaking for myself, you can't leave me a voicemail um, on my phone. So emails are usually the best way to communicate with us. Um, and so communication is just generally a lot more difficult than the on, on the outside. So it's really important to kind of keep that in mind when you're working um, with someone who's in prison. Um, also prison have really strict regime um, that the women need to follow. So that kind of includes um, you know, there's a time that they have to wake up at and then they um, have their food and they have to either go to education or different courses or work. 
And then over the lunch period, they're usually locked in their room and they can't be going anywhere else. And then kind of the same thing in the afternoon. So what me and Becky do on kind of a day to day is we have to work within that regime um, and we can either go and see them in their rooms or we can get them to come to our office for one to one meetings. Um, we can host social workers from the outside kind of coming in and visiting with the prisoners. Um, so there's a range of different things that that we can do. Um, We've covered already a few examples of how we work with the prison, but essentially it can look like a lot of things. Um, so you can actually see on the slide, there's a list of practical ways. I'm not going to go through them, but I'll just give you an example um, of how this can look like in practice to kind of help you think about um, what you can do and how you could work within, um, within that. So uh, essentially I've worked with um, a mother. She was sentenced to eight months in prison. And when she came to prison, her child was placed with the father due to concern, but due to concern for his parenting, um, social services actually planned to put that child into foster care. So mom's main objective when she came into prison to, was to make sure that when she was released, she was in a position to care for her child. Um, and because of her short sentences, we needed to really work quickly and to make sure that we could use her time in prison really positively um, and that her time wasn't wasted. So practically what this looked like over the course of a few months is that um, I communicated almost, I want to say weekly with the local authorities um, assigned social worker, with the CAFCAS worker, as well as with the independent social worker that was carrying out a, a parenting assessment, as well as the solicitor. So a lot of communication, a lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, just so everybody was aware of what was happening. Um, I help facilitate the parenting assessment. So the independent social worker that was um, asked by the courts to carry out an assessment, I allowed for her to come into the prison and actually meet privately with mum. And we also did phone calls and video calls over the course of a few weeks. Um, I sat in during those appointments with her, with her as well. She really said that she wanted support. She didn't trust social services to take her word. Um, there's a lot of communication before her her sentence where she felt that they weren't really listening to her and they knew that she was going to go to prison and they, they had an idea of, of who she was as a person. So just to have that, that support there for her was really helpful. Um, and I was also able to kind of give her some cues and remind her of things that we've spoken about in private appointments that she should bring up for the for the assessment. So generally it, it went really well. Um, I collated information of all the work that she did in prison to kind of provide this dossier for the courts and for social services. So we had um, reports from prison courses that she participated in. She did some in-cell um, workbooks around parenting, anger and relationships. And so I kind of graded all of those and work, um, wrote th these reports around her um, insight and kind of what she got from these, these courses. Um, there's also a report around her behavior around the prison and at work. Um, and then all of that was um, put into this kind of bundle to send to social services to show um, the work that she was doing. Um, and I also communicated with the father and arranged for him to actually bring in the child to come into um, the prison. And because of the age of the child, we were really mindful that this was going to be difficult for her. So I arranged for a private room for them to meet in. Um, there's also issues of domestic abuse between uh, from dad to mom. So I sat in on the contact and I observed um, and made sure, you know, that it was safe um, and the child was not um witness to, to any kind of um, things that weren't really going well between mom and dad. So um, I observed that and I fed back all of my observation to social services and to CAFCAS. Um, ultimately, I think, so she was released in January, a week before her release, social services shared that um, because of all the work that she'd done and all the information they got, she actually could resume caring for her child. And it was planned that she was going to return to her care about a week or two after her release, which was the best outcome that we could have hoped for. Um, she had court about a month after her release and they made it official for her to have um, custody of the child. So essentially what me and, and Becky are trying to do here is to make sure that 
you know, the mother's time in prison is not something that's wasted and we can all work together and be creative and make sure that moms can still be part of their children's lives. Um, I also wanted to add that since kind of working on this project, Becky and I, we've worked on situations where um, what the parent want is not always what is best for the child. And Joe touched on that a bit earlier. Um, but as professionals, we recognize that it's not always appropriate to advocate for contact, um, especially in circumstances where it involves crimes against children. Um, and the, like Joe said, the work we do is always going to be best interest for the children. So I'll just give you a quick example just to, to make you understand what that can kind of look like and what our role is um, within that. So. I'm currently working with a woman who um, was given a life sentence for the murder of her children. So out of the surviving children, some are adopted and some are in long term foster care. Social social services are involved um, and the mother is still entitled to receive yearly lack review minutes along with a general update. So in this particular case, the main thing that um, that I have to do is to manage the mother's expectation. Um, and to be that support on the days where she kind of realizes the gr gravity of the situation and, and what she's what she's lost. Um, but it's also to advocate on her behalf to social services in obtaining those updates. So we're currently trying to access that yearly update and social services are very late in providing it, which has been quite challenging and, and difficult on the mother. Um, and Joe kind of talked on this earlier. Um, about how it, it can be difficult so we're we're just kind of working around that and um but keeping social services aware that we need to keep you know the court orders need to be followed and the ethical thing is to to follow that order and, and it helps the mother kind of grieve and protects the children at the same time um i'll hand over to becky now to talk about the next slide Okay, thanks, Katia. Um, yes, yeah, so that was, I think that was just a really, really great example of, um, they said, what our work can look like in quite a bit of detail. Um, and hopefully, um, as Katia said, listening to that, you can sort of think about how your work might fit into that a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to start a bit of an odd place in the circle, um, but I'm going to start being open minded, which is the blue one, just in terms of thinking about those ways that you guys can help or how we can work together. Um, so being open minded, you know, refraining from judgment, being objective. Um, these are all really core qualities in social work. So nothing new, I'm sure. Um, it's just really important, particularly in this line of work where mothers uh, do experience so much discrimination, um, oppression, stigma, assumptions, all of those things, just to try and keep that open mind, you know, as well as that, this field is a bit of a minefield, even for the people who work in it, um, trying to navigate and coordinate with all of these different people, um, some working, as we said, for the local authority, some working for the prison service, some working for the court system, um, and just trying to all come together and sort of which will lead into but just to kind of make sure information is being shared in a way that we can ask questions and we can tell each other and we can explain things to each other and just keep a really open channel um as a bit of an example of what that can look like you know the, that disparity um where not everybody is perhaps practicing with an open mind um one of the key issues that we do come across quite a lot is photos um, being sent into prisons of children. Um, some social workers that I've come into contact with over the last year do not identify an issue with it at all. Um, they're quite happy to send mum photographs of her children and that's something that they discuss and plan for and perhaps think about how often that's going to happen. Um, whereas other local authorities and other social workers have been much more resistant to the idea um, I will just add that in these specific cases, it's not necessarily related to the mother's offence, as Katty was sort of referring to. Um, it's often a reflection of a lack of understanding of the prison environment or perhaps a lack of understanding about how those systems work, who's around, how people are categorised. Um, and I think what I would suggest is just to, as we sort of we would always say is just to take it on a case by case basis um, and just to, to communicate with the press professionals that are involved to sort of determine 
what's you know what's going to help to promote that relationship between the mother and the child if appropriate what's in the best interest of the child um that sort of leads quite nicely i think into sharing which i've probably touched on a little bit already just in that you know sharing information is 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 always helpful and is always critical um mum obviously at this point is is living in a different environment perhaps it's harder to get in touch with it's harder to communicate with or to visit um but the, the more we share information, as Katia's example demonstrated, the more that we can really support mums and hopefully, you know, promote positive relationships within families. Absolutely, Donna. You, we always hear it in, in every review that you sort of see multi-agency working always seems to be at the heart of either what didn't go so well or what could have been done better. Um, and so, yeah, just within the environment that we're working within, it's just something that's really, really beneficial. Katia, do you want to pick up the uh, the other few? Yeah, I'll um so I'll touch on to be aware of time. Um it might we've we've run into some issues where um arranging meetings um is done quite quickly and we have we're asking you to kind of provide us with enough time, um give sufficient notice, um check the, the processes um and the pre prison regime before you organize meetings. It's really important. Um, we can't, if there's a meeting that's going ahead the next day or in two days, it's it's really difficult for us to make it happen. But we think that the mothers need to be involved in all those meetings. And if we give us sufficient time, then we can arrange that. Um, and that kind of falls into the establishing contact and communication. Um, so with communication, just be mindful that it can be a lot harder for women to keep in touch. Um, I think, Becky, you, you touched on that before, but um, you might have to maybe go a bit more out of your way than you normally would. Um, but these efforts mean so much to the women and it shows that they're not forgotten and that they're still at the, the center of their family and they can still be mothers. Um, so, you know, just being a bit more creative um, in terms of, of how you communicate with them. So keep in regular contact with her by phone calls, letters, come to the prison if you can spare the time, um, really prioritize the face-to-face -face and video calls because it really helps to build a positive relationship and it shows that you know, you're not judging them and you're willing to go out of your way to, to hear their voices. Um, and yeah, send letters and give updates after the meetings, send the minutes, just anything to keep her um, as involved as possible. Jo, over to you. Thank you so much. So from the really practical examples, um, back to a poll, having heard what Katia and Becky are doing, um, we're curious in what do you need most to empower you with the confidence to work with a mother in prison? So we've put a couple of options together in the poll. And so the options that we've got there are more training or workshops, more written information and guidance, seeing the prison or mother and baby unit for yourself. We just, we'd like to be really responsive. So we're really curious as to your views. Um, we'd really like to get your thoughts. Again, if you're seeing this afterwards, um, please do use this as a reflective question that you can chat about in supervision. Um, you can think about what else might be useful for you. If there's something you think PACT can help with, please do reach out to us using the contact details um, that we've got at the end of the slide deck. Um, we're hoping to do more awareness and we're hoping that by providing this kind of awareness that um, you are also more aware and then you can pass that on as well. Thinking about reflection, and again, you very well to take this away is a question that, that you might be able to think of um, and reflect on. It's, it's a promise of sorts, I guess. Um, one thing that you can do to proactively help improve outcomes for families where someone's in prison. Um, and we've reached sort of 180, just over 180 people, I think, through awareness raising things. And if each of those 186 people made one promise, um, of, about improving outcomes for families where someone's in prison, um, I think that would start to create a big wave of change. So it could be as simple as um, that you would reach out to the prison family team to make contact and arrange to speak to them, um, as Katia gave that example. 
Um, it might be to use prison voicemail to explain a decision before sending a, a letter, which, as Becky said, is, is jargony and wordy so that the person can fully understand what's happening. Um, it might be to share information and resources from today at a team meeting um, and encouraging your, your colleagues to see the recording. That's, that's really helpful as well. Thank you so much. Another very short video. So this is another different type of resource. Um, and if you are working with children who are perhaps visiting prison for the first time, they might be nervous of going into a prison and are not sure what to expect. This kind of resource can help. So this was filmed at HMP Swansea, it's aimed at young children. Um, and it can be found in the children's area of our website. And there's other sort of complementary materials there, such as a My Visit book that you can download and they can draw into. Um, there are cards where a child can tick how they're feeling and leave it on a teacher's desk so that they don't have to find the words to explain themselves. Uh, there's a book called Locked Out, which came about as a result of co-working with children and parents about the kind of information and support they needed to tackle the situ situation of imprisonment together. Um, Katia has also produced a children's guide to visit in HMP Send, um, which I will share in the files. Um, it's useful for mothers as well because they don't know how the process looks from a visitor point of view. Um, so it's a good way to, for them to explain to their child what to expect as well. So I'll share that document first. And then Katja, if you want to say anything about that after the clip, you're very welcome to. Um, and I will start the next clip. Hi, I'm William the Bear. I know what it's like to have someone you love go to prison. My job is to answer any questions you may have about prison. A question I get asked a lot is, what is it like in prison? Today, I'm going to visit a prison. Here's my story about my visit. I met a governor who is like a school headmistress. She is the boss and a really nice lady. Sometimes I get asked, what do people in prison have to eat? I've had a look at the menu for Friday. That looks yummy. Fish and chips, my favorite. Mm. I get asked what people do in prison. Some people can go to school just like you and me. Some can learn about computers. They can also have help with their spelling and writing. Or they can go to the library. I went to the library. They had a reading club just like at my school. There's other things to do like fixing bikes. I sat on a bike which had been repaired. Do you have a bike? Is it like this one? Some people like to keep fit. There's a gym where people can get fit. I had to go on a machine, although I couldn't use it. My legs are too small. You're not allowed mobile phones in prison. They use these phones to ring us. When people come to prison, they have a room where their beds are. In a corridor, like this. We have to be quiet because everyone is asleep. On Sundays, everybody can go to the church if they want to, where they can sing hymns. On visits day, children can play and draw. Do you like my drawing? If anybody gets poorly, they can see a nurse and a doctor to make them better. I went to say goodbye to the governor and thank her for my visit. 
I feel better, now I know what it's really like in prison. If you're worried or scared about anything to do with prisons, you can contact me, William the Bear, at this address or by email on Facebook or Twitter. Goodbye and thanks for listening. So that was William the Bear um, visiting prison, which we hope you might find useful. Um, Katia, I'm going to hand over to you to talk about this quote and any um, any comments you've got about the file that we shared, which was the Send Children's Visiting Booklet. Um, yeah, the, the file um, we created at Send, we actually took pictures of the whole kind of process of a child coming in to visit a family member, the dogs going to visit and, and we kind of made it child friendly. So the, the aim is that we are um, sending it over to all the professionals. So we're having some social workers kind of say, you know, this child is worried about coming in so we can send that resource over to them. They can prepare the child. So we're hoping um, to, I know there's other prisons who are trying to adapt it to their own prisons, but we'll, this is going to be in the files as well. So if you do want to have it just to prepare a child for um, it might not be the same prison, but it's it's helpful nonetheless. Um, this quote, so I honestly think that the children have usually benefited from the communication I've had with you and their mum. And also, I hope that having established a relationship with mum prior to her release will help her to continue to do well and be able to sustain a positive relationship with the children with my ongoing support. Um, this was such a nice... Um, case to work on. Essentially, mum hadn't seen the children in about two years. Um, she was serving about three years in, in prison. Um, and over the course of about a year, we worked together in communicating with social services and mum to reestablish that contact. So for, I want to say about 10 months time, we had monthly video calls between mum and her social worker and they chatted about the children and um, they did some work around parenting um, and just building that rapport um, and about a month or two before her release we actually arranged for a video call between mum and the children so the children had their foster cares next to them and social worker and mum had me in the same room and we all kind of had this big um, video call together where the kids saw mom for the first time in, in two years and it really set the scene for when she was going to be released it, it she was trusting of that social worker she kept consistently showing up um, and asking her question and not judging and so after her release she felt confident going into meetings by herself um with the social worker because she had built that bond so it just really goes to show that that extra effort that you can put in in reaching out i know it's difficult sometimes because prisons make things you know really hard um for the outside but it really makes a big difference and these children now have you know that that great bond with their mum, um and it's just kind of growing from there uh so this next bit i've just realized this and i you can only see a little bit of what more it's actually about but so we just just to think a little bit about unconscious bias um so I'm sure a lot of you know what unconscious bias is, either you learned about it when you were studying um, to be social workers or perhaps it's come up in CPD or training since. But I really like this definition from the University of Edinburgh. I think it's a little bit more uh, personal and humanistic, perhaps, rather than overly academic. So just the tendency as human beings to act in ways that are prompted by a range of assumptions and biases that we aren't aware of. Um, unconscious bias is everywhere but it's so and it's a completely natural part of the human thinking process but as social workers it's so important that we recognize the possible impact of that bias when we're working with people um we have the ability to change people's lives to change children's lives to change parents lives um to change you know the experiences of of entire families and that's that's a real privilege, but it's essential that we're mindful of our conscious and our unconscious thinking to make sure that that's a positive impact that we're having. Um, the way that, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, so it's particularly relevant in the work that Katya and I do in the prisons, 
just because there is, as we sort of said before, there's a lot of assumptions that can be made and stigma that these mothers encounter. Um, and so it's, it's yeah, it's really important that we're sensitive to how they might be feeling and also how we're feeling ourselves. Um, so how, how can we tackle it? You know, how can we make sure that these assumptions and these biases that we aren't aware of um, aren't affecting the, the objectivity and the, um, the integrity of our work? Um, so the first one, just to recognise that we all have them, um, we need to remove this stigma really that's associated with having unconscious biases in the first place. Um, we all have them, they're not deliberate. And actually, you know, how can we acknowledge and address something that we're not recognising exists, you know, by by acknowledging that they're there and that we have them, we can then start to think about how they might affect our work. Um, Self-reflection and analysis, both independently and through supervision. So, you know, it's important that we take time to reflect on our own values and experiences and behaviour. And that might be in our professional and also in our personal lives um, and how this might create or facilitate our unconscious biases i suppose um this should of course be encouraged within supervision and if it isn't then i encourage you to ask for it to be in there um, and for it to be acknowledged and for it to be discussed um but it's equally important that we take our own uh, personal responsibility for, for thinking about unconscious bias and i'm sure everyone here is doing their cpd logs for social work england um but it sort of routinely comes up, you know, that, that learning can be found anywhere. You know, it could be a news article or a documentary and it could be something that enables you to just ask yourself those questions about, you know, where do those thoughts come from? Um, avoid making rushed or instinctive decisions, thinking about how you can promote objective judgment in your work. Um, this is a crucial one just because you know often what is our instinctive response is usually the one that's most loaded with our bias and assumptions and so it's a really good point to just take a step back and uh, and just have a think about what is guiding your practice at that point um and the last one that we've sort of made a note of here is probably the one that we see everywhere in every kind of way to, to improve practice. And that's to listen to others and to seek feedback and share good practice. Um, we're all here to support each other. And fundamentally, we're all trying to improve the lives of others. And so, yeah, share, share the good stuff and, and talk about things. Um, I will just make a slight nod to sort of cultural competency and other sort of more um, nuanced, I suppose, areas of practice and just being really particularly mindful of those very specific areas where people might encounter um, more bias than others. And just to, yeah, just to pay particular attention to that when you come across it. Thanks, Joe. Thanks so much, Becky. Excellent reminder um, of our responsibilities and unconscious bias, thank you. So following on from that, another quick reflective question, um, and I've got an eye on the time, so I'm going to ask you to think about this as the next clip is playing. So the next clip that we've got for you, the final clip, it's slightly longer. It's about 10, 11 minutes long. Um, it features the voices of women in prison talking about their experiences, and it's a group that we held as part of a women's project um, a couple of years ago. It does contain some mild swearing, so I apologise in advance, um, and some emotional dialogue. Um, and also, as the clip is playing, I'll put into the chat the um, address for the packed YouTube page where you can find any of these clips should you wish to look at them again later. One tars all female prisoners with the same brush. It's like you're a bad mum and you're not interested. You don't give a shit about your kids. You did give a shit about your kids. You wouldn't commit a crime.
So I got arrested at the hospital. Take him to CID. I think I went into a state of shock. Because I, when I was thinking back to it, it's quite weird to think back to it. It's like I was floating. It's like I was watching someone else go through it. They took me to the town station, which is just a little police station. Strip search me. Strip search me. Found heroin in my bra. I think it was about nine o'clock in the morning. I was in bed, so my daughter has answered the door, and um, I came downstairs, and it was three. It was three CID. I knew it was going to happen. I didn't think it was going to happen in front of my daughter. And I couldn't explain to my kids, so they was panicking and crying. I was literally there twenty minutes. Um, they bailed me. I, I'm I'm a very anxious person. I'm very, but I, I I was I just I. I just was on my own. Um, my daughter was told that she would be separated from me. Well, we just didn't really know what was going on. We thought that she could go with my mum. Um, uh, there wasn't like a social worker there or anything. They contacted my mum, which who had my children, and said, we've got to come, you need to get the kids out of school, we've got to see if the kids are safe. You feel detached from everything. It's it's happening, you're in shock, um, it doesn't feel real, it's like surreal. My mum couldn't get hold of me, so my mum thought something could happen to me, she thought I was dead. She thought those police had come to the house to tell her I was dead. And I remember going to the interview room and I had to have um, a mental health person present. Like, I was saying to myself the other night, I was just thinking, you know, one minute you can have everything and then within a second it can all be just gone, just mm -hmm. like that. I think understanding for me when I was waiting to be sentenced, no one explained to me what sentencing meant. They, did, they front pagered us and then new, put us on BBC News and it's like, my kids still got to live in that area. I'm, I'm away from all that. I can't hear what's going on, but my children can't. My children got to go up the streets. My children got to go to school. My children still got to live. Like they don't think of none of that and what my children are going to go through because it wasn't only me that got punished. They're getting punished in school. Um, it's scary. I think you've got so much emotions going through your mind. Even when they're all talking, after things, I just did not know what they were saying. And you're walking into court and you've got the media taking photos of you. You don't even know if they're taking them. And then you're in the paper the next day. Even my mother, who, who never got convicted of the crime, was in the newspaper. I think it's wrong. And it is. It's like a ripple effect. Yeah. It's, it don't just affect you. It affects everybody so far along. I, didn't, I knew the day I was going to court, I knew that I was going to get seven years. And then they just got us in cuffs and like all the family was screaming in the back by the glass and I couldn't even bring myself to look. My 16 year old daughter was in court as well and she came running to the box where I was and was trying to get her hand through the little gap. They wouldn't let me touch her, wouldn't let me say goodbye. I've never been so disabled in my life. I think that's what makes it the hardest week to not communicating with your kids and your family to let them know you're safe. I didn't come out myself for nearly a month, four weeks of being here first, wasn't it? Yeah. All I done was sock my heart out. I lost weight. First night, Definitely. We, I think we were scared. It was, we didn't know what was going on. We weren't explained mm. anything. It really shocked me. It's like, it's how this is, my crime, what's happened to me, has just impacted my friends and family. Yeah. I can't believe it. Like, it's like, I think it's affected my older children more than it, than my youngest ones. Because they're not used to being without their, their mothers. I've constantly been there. Like, I don't go out. My life consists of my children. As much as they're, you're getting punished, your kids are getting yeah. punished as well, so there's, there is not a lot of support because they, we're just ripped away from each other and they've got nothing. Every visit I get excited as anything. The day of the visit I'll leave, I'll be in tears. Oh, my kids saying to me now, don't cry man, don't cry. Yeah. I do feel no, my kids are like, mum are you okay? Are you sure you're not getting bullied if I'm crying and things? Mm -hmm. My older one, he always asks me the same question. Mm -hmm. Are you sure no one started on you? And that's how they think prison is. They've gone to, they went to permanently sever contact. So from having her in my care for 11 years, they, they literally, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let 
me phone her. When I first come in, they wouldn't let me phone her. Um, they wouldn't let me see her. We want them to stay on track. We want to be able to support them. So it's, I think it's, a, it's definitely a greater benefit for the kids to have contact with us than not. I've got social workers involved with my son and he's only like one year and seven months old. But he does live with my sister. I mean, I get to see him once a month. Um, my next visit with him will be next month. Like, you don't really get to speak for yourself. It's like other people have to speak for you. I can't stand any more rejections. Or I just haven't been brave enough to be just rejected and pushed away even more, you know. I haven't got a voice, clearly. So. And like you dread, like who's going to be there on the visit when your kids, when you're over in six anyway, you think so who's going to be there on the day my kids come and visit, do you feel like that? Because I do. A packed visit, it's in the mornings, Monday to Friday, and you can get up and play with your children, you've got art and craft that you can do with them. I think it's helped me bond better with my children. Basically. I wouldn't see my kids if yeah. I didn't have that. My hopes and dreams are to get out of here. And I've done a call, I'm doing a diploma now in beauty therapist. When I do get out, that I'm going to better myself for my children and to prove to my children that I can't, like I'm not going to be coming back in where I am now. Probably try and make every opportunity educational. We really start afresh, so mm. build, build a relationship with your kids and just back to normality, really. To stay healthy and to not be a letdown anymore. To be something for my uh, kids to be proud of and my family and achieve at least something. I'm just going to find it really hard to go back out there because I'm scared and sometimes I feel like I don't know how I'm going to do it because I'm on my own I won't have no one and I just, you know, I just want to try and do my best because I don't want my son to like hate me and think that I never tried my hardest uh, getting back. Go out and be a mum again. I know I won't have my kids start fresh, but to be stay clean off drugs and live my life. Just be happy. Mums, sisters, daughters and family members. They're people with lives and a future ahead of them. They're dealing with a range of complex issues such as drugs, mental health issues, self-harm. Many of the women have suffered sexual abuse, domestic violence and their mums who are at risk of losing their children. We as professionals need to be supporting these women on all aspects of their lives to give them the best hope of a new start. We provide one-to-one -one support, casework, relationship and parenting programmes. We work with external agencies such as probation, social services and housing and together we can really make a difference. Through working together with the prison and in the community, we can give these women a much better chance of rehabilitation and a brighter future. At PACT, we believe in the value of every human being. By working together, we can support these women to truly make a fresh start. Thank you very much to the um courageous women who allowed us to share their stories um that pretty much brings us back to um to the end of the presentation it's certainly our privilege to allow women's voices to be heard um, and to provide a platform for them to share their experiences um we are very welcoming of any questions so whether you want to know whether women can smoke in prison or whether you want to know how you can get in touch um, with people from the project 
we are really open to answering any questions, not just today, obviously. Um, but you can contact us as promised throughout the presentation. Um, there's lots of resources on our website, including the Locked Out book, and you can find links to those there. Um, if you'd like to email me about anything you want to know, whether you want to book a visit to visit the prison and to get more familiar with the prison environment, whether you've got a case um, with a mother at um, Eastwood Park or Send and you'd like to get in touch with the social workers, please do email me and I'll pass that on. Um, and you can find out any information about prison. So packed are only in some prisons, um, but you can find out about all prison family services and their visiting arrangements using that link there, um, which is about visitors guides. We will be sharing the slides um, and the files that came into chat. Um, so if you'd like to um, provide any feedback once you've had those, once you've had the chance to have a look again, please do. We'd like this to be a conversation um, as opposed to a lecture. Thank you so much for joining us on that. Thank you very much from PACT.